tell me about why this NPT is important to you. I was here at the first NPT review conference in 1995. They've had them every five years since. And uh, in fact, for the 26 days of that conference, I and Williamson Coffin fasted on water for the 26 days of the conference in what we call the abolition fast. And the idea was we need abolition fast. And in fact, the group Abolition 2000 rose out of that gathering. The idea being that we should at least by the year 2000, five years away, should have uh, a treaty, a convention in mind for the eventual abolition. Of course, we're no closer to that, no closer to that than before. The United States, which agreed to a number of preparatory steps in the direction of obeying Article 6 and the eventual elimination of uh, nuclear weapons, did so in total good, bad faith, total bad faith. There was no intention, I believe, in any year of any American administration to fulfill its international obligations under that treaty of Article 6, which calls for the prompt uh, initiation of negotiations toward a prompt elimination of nuclear weapons. They have never intended, and it's not only the United States, uh, the other nuclear weapon states, I think, of which there are now nine. At that time, by the way, there weren't nine. In 1995, uh, I remember predicting that the refusal of the United States even to uh, acknowledge a no first use pledge, saying that we would not initiate nuclear war, a refusal ever, including into this administration, to sign that, I said was a uh, provocation, basically, to other states to acquire those nuclear weapons, and that India was likely the first to follow that. And in fact, un unhappily, I was not wrong in that prediction. It was within a year or two that India had, in fact, tested its nuclear weapons, inevitably leading Pakistan to do so. And of course, North Korea has done it since. So then we had, at that time, we had, I guess, six nuclear weapon states, now nine. But it isn't the speed of proliferation that's really the uh, terrible thing here. It's the fact that none of the states have made any progress to speak of, worth noticing. The, the number of weapons has decreased between the U.S. and Russia, but not to a level that precludes nuclear winter. We're far above the level that would cause nuclear winter and worldwide famine, near extinction of the human species, if we carried out our existing war plans. I wrote the guidance, drafted the guidance for Secretary McNamara in 1961 for the operational nuclear war plans. I know what those things do and they have not changed in their potential for destroying life on Earth if we carried them out. If we carried out our plans in terms of the smoke from the burning cities that would be lofted into the stratosphere for a decade or more, shutting out sunlight and causing the universal starvation. That's outrageous. And uh, the reason I think we're here is to say that every nation in the world, every person in the world, has a right to protest the policies existence of every nuclear weapon states, but above all, the United States and Russia. So just two follow-ups now. Are you saying the war plans that were put in place when you were working under McNamara are still in place at this point? Essentially so. The number of weapons has declined, but it would still be virtually certain that thanks to the military targets we, uh, we target, which many of which are in cities, command and control centers, communication centers, transportation centers, air defense, missile launch uh, fields, which are in many cases in Russia near cities. The cities of Russia would burn today as they burned, would have burned 40 years ago. And as I say, the smoke from that would cause an effect that we didn't envision or imagine 40 years ago. Nuclear winter from the smoke, more than the radiation going globally, worldwide, cutting out, killing harvests all around the world and effectively leading to universal starvation. So the effect would be the same now despite the fact that the number of weapons has declined. Uh, we've gone down to uh, in aiming at 1,550 alert weapons of our almost 5,000 weapons. Russians about the same. That's far more than is needed to cause nuclear winter. 1,000 is too many, 500 is too many so, uh, to avoid that. So we haven't really approached a level in which we fail threaten human extinction. Well, you've painted a pretty 
pretty uh, sad and grim picture here. So are you hopeful or what, what's your assessment at this point well, uh, on the eve? Uh, all I can say is uh, we need a change in policy and possibly in system uh, structure and social in all these countries like that that occurred in the Soviet Union in the ending of the Cold War, in the ending of the USSR. An enormous change, but it did happen. And in South Africa, majority uh, rule here uh, actually took place without violence. No one foresaw that. We need a change, I'm sorry to say, that unexpected at this point, but it is possible. It's not zero. And the stakes are so high that it's worth the lives of all these people and many, many more to try to avoid that. I'm here particularly to pay my tribute to people who have been spending their lives, many of them, some of them at least, longer than I have, the 40 years that I've spent at it, exposing and resisting nuclear annihilation. They've spent their lives well, and they'll continue to do it. Uh, last question. Uh, we look around in that room at Coover Union, and everybody was older, well, yes, older people. Nice. What is the issue? Why can, why, we have so many intelligent, bright young people, there's social media, why are they not engaged on this issue? Well, the older people, of course, have been at it so long because the government is still at it, and uh, our job is, is not at all done. The young people actually haven't lived in a world uh, of the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Berlin Crisis, which I've participated in, both of those, in the Pentagon. And they really haven't been made aware by the media or the Congress people or their presidents of the danger that actually still exists from these two doomsday machines that are poised to uh, trigger, be triggered by a false alarm of the kind that's happened many times. I don't think they have much awareness that there is a nuclear threat. We're out here to try to wake people up, but there's few of us, it's a minority, and the media, of course, has not done that. So there isn't a youth movement altogether of the kind there was in the 60s. Uh, but in particular, I don't think if youth were to focus on one problem, they may think of climate, which is the other threat to our survival as, as a species. There are two, and they're only aware of one, unhappily. So we're at least trying to do what we can to uh, wake them up. And, and this really is my last question. Uh, just a few miles away from here is an 85-year-old Catholic nun, Sister Megan Rice, who was sentenced to almost three years in prison for trespassing at uh, the Y-12 nuclear complex in order to raise consciousness. And there were five people out on the West Coast who also went to prison for their beliefs. What are your thoughts about these people? Well, they're doing what they can, all that they can. They're putting their bodies on the line to do this. As I said a moment ago, you know, the people who've been doing this all their lives, I'm 84, you see the nun is 85, and she may have been doing this longer than I have. I would say that what it's what the Buddha called right livelihood, uh, which excludes, by the way, arms makers and poison makers. And what Gandhi would say is it's important to expose and resist such activities. And that's what they're doing. So I would say the nun has done not more than she should have done, and not less. She's done what she could, and that's what called from, for from all of us. I think she's setting a wonderful example, and I thank her.